School board races are a big focus for voters since schools have become ground zero for shifts in political direction in Florida. Broward and Monroe school board seats were all decided in the August primary, but in Miami-Dade, two seats are up for a vote. We've had the debate for District 3 here a few weeks ago. You can actually find that if you like, posted on Local10.com. Both candidates for District 7 right here for a This Week in South Florida style debate today. Mary Blanco is the incumbent in that seat, appointed to the school board by Governor Ron DeSantis in January to fill an opening. This is her first actual election to retain it. She's a guidance counselor at a private school and also serves on Miami-Dade College's Board of Trustees. She spent 15 years at Broward School District as a school psychologist. This is also the first election for Maxine Max Tuckman. She was a longtime Miami-Dade high school teacher who became an education entrepreneur. Her company launched a literacy platform since purchased by Mattel. She's also a former local head of Teach for America. And I'm very grateful that you both eked out a little bit of your Sunday morning to be here to do this great service for viewers. Welcome. Thank, thank you. you, thank you for having me. So uh, alphabetical order, Blanco first. Um, I wanna just sort of give viewers a sense of why you're here and what the intentions are. So I know you are not keen on the actual campaign. Public service, yes, campaigning, no, but yet here you are and you have a bit of a record to run on. Um, so what do you think you've done for the past year that has earned your right to keep the seat? Well, thank you. You know, my main focus as being on the school board has been the mental health of our students. And along with that, two very important things, the safety and security of our schools and student learning. I always say that if a child is not in their right place in heart and mind, they're not going to be able to do their best. And so along with that, many of the items that I proposed have to do with um, providing our students opportunities, rising seniors to get support that they need in applying for college and getting ready for the post-secondary. I've increased pipelines to have more counselors in our schools. And recently there's been a pilot of vaping detectors in our schools that has gone extremely well. Those have all been initiatives that I've brought forward. Have, th have those been initiatives that are supported by the whole board? Yes, they were all unanimously approved. You know, what's, what's so interesting in school board members, I find that I don't think I've ever met a school board member who did not really have the students' priorities in mind, and yet the priorities for the school board members and the perspectives are so different, which is which is why these kind of things are so important. Max Tuckman, a longtime teacher and then businesswoman. Yeah. And what what do you come to this campaign with? What's the intention here? Well, I think that's exactly why I'm running because my entire career has been in public education, has been in service of children and you know teachers and and our community. Um, and so for me, you know, when I look at the school board it's a policy role and it's a business role I mean it's a seven billion dollar budget that our school board members are are in charge of um, and as a former businesswoman someone you know who sold I think I think it's interesting I don't think a lot of people know this but I sold my company to Mattel Mattel makes five billion in revenue a year I mean, that's the scale that we're talking about, right? So we need people who... And, and you yeah. work for Mattel now? Is that how it works? I noticed on your financials, you yeah. draw a salary from Mattel. Yes, so I'm just finishing up my time with Mattel as the general manager of Caribou, the company that I started. Um, but I, you know, I, I think the, the fiscal responsibility, the, the accountability to taxpayers and, and the money that they are giving us in, in stewardship uh, is incredibly important. And then also on the policy side, you know, this is why I got an MBA and a master's in public policy, specifically to make sure that we are looking at how business and pol you know, uh, political organizations can really work together in these public-private partnerships. You know, I've listened to past interviews that the, the two of you have done, and, and like so many school board members, the focus is, and, and you want the focus to be on literacy and the basics. And I always find that to be an interesting question to delve into because w what are the basics? I, I think reading, writing, arithmetic for basics, that's just me. Um, so Mary, what does basics mean to you and how would you impl implement that going right. forward? So it's exactly what you said. We want to focus on education, which is the purpose of schools, while understanding that parents' rights needs to come first, right? And so when we talk about the back to basics in education, we are leaving out extreme social ideologies, political things, and we are just keeping students educated on the main things while avoiding indoctrination. Okay, so that's a lot to unpack. But I, before we go there, and, uh, and you actually segue very nicely into some things I wanted to get into, but Max, I wanna get into, for you, what does basics mean? Yeah, I agree. Um, unfortunately, less than 50% of our third graders can read on grade level. Is that a COVID 
uh, result or is that something else? This has been going on for a long time. If you look at reports in the 1980s, a nation at risk, right? When we defund our public schools, we, we start to see these gaps forming. Um, and it's actually even worse when we look at demographic breakdowns. That's unacceptable. As a businesswoman, I couldn't hire our students out of Miami-Dade County Public Schools because the reading level was just not there. The technical skills were not there. The, the advanced you know, technical skills that we are going to need in the future were not there. Um, and so for me, when I think about getting back to basics, it's absolutely can our kids read and write? And one of the things people don't realize is when AI is, you know, wh first of all, AI is here, right? But when AI continues to, uh, to scale throughout the system, we are going to need our students to have an understanding of the English language. There is no way to prompt AI without understanding the English language. So mm -hmm. we have got to get back to basics, make sure that our students understand how to command the language. We need to make sure our teachers are prepared for that and also our parents. Mary, I see you. Okay. I saw you shake your head and then I saw you nod. <laughs> <laughs> Please respond. So our students are actually achieving above 50th percentile, right? When it comes to reading and to math. Is that and students or I, th I think you said third graders? Third graders. Is that, oh, do you know? That at all grade yeah. levels, right? Mm -hmm. We are above that. We are above the Florida average. And so to say that our students couldn't be hired, I think is not a fair statement. Uh, we've been a, you know, rated a A school for A district for the last five years. And when you look at the makeup of our schools and you take into account that in the last two years, we have had 40,000 students come in immigrant students and we are still achieving at the levels that we are. I think it says a lot about our district and a lot about the good things that we are doing. And when it comes to AI, absolutely, we are embracing that. We have new programs that are coming into place and we recognize that. And a lot of the things that I will say on the school board is that our job is not just to educate the child and get them to graduate, it's we need to hold their hand and help them make that connection to that post-secondary process, something I talk about on the school board all the time. And many of my items have been geared towards that. So does that mean, practically speaking, in the 11th or 12th grade, when and seniors, juniors and seniors are starting to look at college, a, a, a person, a guidance counselor, mm -hmm. a, you know, designate whatever job. Actually, I know some of the private schools have someone taking them through that process, hand-holding. Is, is that what you mean? So absolutely, and as a matter of fact, that addresses one of my very first item that I'm extremely proud of. So we have a cap advisor at every single one of our high schools. Some of our high schools have a large number of students, and it is impossible for that one person to be able to address the needs of all of those students. And so the very first item that I put allowed for our rising seniors to have a summer workshop where they could get started on college applications. And many of the students have said, I never thought I would be able to get to this process. I didn't think I would be able to to find the financial aid and going through this week-long process in the summer before the busyness of the school year starts, they they felt great and they felt like they were able to get ready for that. Is that is that something that you would prioritize as well? Absolutely. I was a 12th grade teacher, so this is what I dealt with you in saw the it firsthand. I saw it firsthand yeah. how stressed yeah. students were about the process, how they felt like they had you know, waited too long. Um, but it is something that the ratio is completely off, right? We have too few of these CAP and guidance counselors mm -hmm. for our students, especially in our larger high schools. We were talking a little bit about parents' rights in education, which is actually the name of the law that education operates under in the state of Florida. And, um, and I, I was interested, Mary, in how you phrase that because you included extremism, getting away from extremism. Um, parents' rights in education, like who doesn't want parents' rights in education? But when it comes down to it, this is really applicable in sex education and race education. The nuances have become very partisan. I want to get your take on what parents' rights in education has been about and if it is succeeding the way it is intended. Right. I think one thing we can know, we know for sure, is that during the pandemic, parents were able to see some of the things that were happening in the classroom, and they weren't happy with that. And that's what prompted a lot of the parents' rights, um, you know, law. And so. We need to understand, and this is a phrase I say every single time I meet with parents and speak to parents, thank you for entrusting your children to us. Because while I'd love to call my students, I, I call them mine, right? Because that's how much I care about my students. But at the end of the day, they're not my students. And I have to respect the rights of those parents and what it is that they feel is appropriate for their children. And so they have made it very clear when it comes to certain topics, they do not feel that school is the place for that. They want to reserve the right to have those conversations with their children at home. Y you know what I've heard, and, and I absolutely don't want to put any words in anybody's mouth, but what I heard to be the pushback on that is where does one parent's rights begin mm -hmm. and another parent's rights who might want the opposite end? And I think that's kind of the essential question of this law. Max Tuckman, um, what weigh in on that? Yeah, and I, I think that's exactly right. Um, 
there's not one person that doesn't think that parents should be involved. When I was a teacher, I, I wanted all my parents to be involved. When I saw parents involved, I saw our students thrive. And so that's incredibly important. I think the issue becomes when one parent is making a decision for other children. And so every parent has the right to make the decision that is best in the best interest of their child. But when you are making a decision that affects more students outside of your own children, that's when it becomes an issue. So let's go like a, a practical example would be very recently, just a few weeks ago, the Department of Education is making a couple of counties redo their sex education and mm -hmm. focus on abstinence. So, uh, Barry, what do you think about a uh, holistic sex education is much broader than abstinence. Do you, right. uh, and, and some parents might agree with that wholeheartedly and some may not wholeheartedly. Right. How do you handle something like that? I think it's extremely important to allow for all aspects to be, um, you know, taught if that's what's deserved. But I think that parents, again, need to have that opportunity to opt in into something that they don't agree with or to opt out. And we need to ensure that we give that right um, to our parents because one of the things that I am very clear about, and this comes with my training as a school psychologist, is I understand child development. And when we talk about child development, you can't just pick one particular age and say, well, at this age, this is appropriate, because not all ch children develop at the same rate. And so many of these topics have to do with when is it developmentally appropriate. And because that's very difficult to define, I think that's where we need to ensure that we are protecting those parents' rights. You know, and when you get into high school, you know, you as a high school teacher, I'm sure when you get to 12th, 12th graders are essentially <laughs> young adults. Many of them are. I mean, how, how would you handle something like that? Well, again, I think, especially when it comes to sex ed, 99.9% .9 of parents do not opt out of sex ed because they recognize that they need help. And a lot of times it is, they entrust us to have experts and be able to put the terms in, you know, in ways that kids can relate to. And, and parents want that. And so again, if a parent wants to opt out, they want to opt their child out of something, they can. Um, but to change the curriculum based off of a minority of voices is very dangerous. You know, I, oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I don't think it's a minority of voices. I think for a long time, the majority has been silent. And I think when you look at the last two years, when the item has come up to recognize LBGTQ, the loudest voices, the number of people that came out. And that is one of the things that parents absolutely want. As I went knocking door to door, want, want they do want. not want the LBGTQ agenda in our schools, which involves the sexualization of children. So a lot of what we're talking about now, parents do not want that in the schools. Well, I so think when that's you, an interesting one, but yeah. That, that did not pass. There is. A, it used to almost be a rubber stamp, a LGBTQ rec uh, celebration month, uh, along with other months celebrating other cultures. Um, and that has been a bone of contention because of what the law says. There is no LGBTQ instruction in Correct. the curriculum in mm -hmm. schools, was not and is not. But a month of celebrating does not really apply there. So how, how do you see that as different? Well, I think that it's not just about instruction, right? Even if it's not in our curriculum, if it's recognized, there is no control as to what exactly will be happening in the schools. And that is where parents do not, they simply do not want those conversations taking part in their schools in any way. And how would you handle that? Yeah, Next. I think the clarification needs to be around exactly what you said, which is it's an acknowledgement of a people that exist. There was no curriculum that was attached to that bill. And I find it very interesting that we've spent so many hours talking about these types of bills that a lot of times are really just trying to bring politics into the classroom and make these politically divisive um, decisions when we're not focusing on academics or taxpayer accountability. For example, we have a $179 million settlement that has not gotten one minute of airtime at our school board meetings, and yet we're spending dozens of hours discussing whether a people should be acknowledged. Well, and it's gotten it's gotten time on the news, just yes, for the record. Thank you. Let, let me just ask you this, because as a as a guidance counselor and wanting to be inclusive mm -hmm. for all people and all students, is is the message of we don't want that in our schools, not including a significant number of students who right. may be LGBTQ. What I was referring to is that we don't want conversations about it. It's not about not including our students. Mm -hmm. I want the all of our students to feel included. I want all of our students to have the appropriate mental health services, and that's something that I advocate for on this board all the time as a school counselor, right? So it is not about that. It is that when we talk about this, I know what happens when we recognize something in our schools. It's all over our social media. It's on our website banners. Our students are logging into that, and that is what the parents don't, they, they just don't want that conversation in the schools. And again, we serve children. We serve children as young as three years old in our schools. 
Let, let me turn to a little bit about about money because parental choice now with the uh, now we have universal vouchers. So mm -hmm. the money per pupil, eight thousand dollars, give or take, right. goes with the student to a choice school. Uh, in many cases, out of the public school. And Max Tuckman, if you would, this is parental choice. It evens the playing field for parents to send their kids, uh, kind of, and we'll get into that in a minute. But but it, how do you do that without cannibalizing public schools? Yeah, no, so I think it's about $2.7 billion have been spent in the first year of the expansion of the voucher program. And yet us as taxpayers do not have any accountability for those dollars outside of our traditional public schools. Is, is, that, so, not, is that not true? true. But Ken, let me just hear your response to that. Okay. The, the, and then the, we'll go on. Yeah. yeah. The private schools that do receive money from the Florida Empowerment Scholarship have to send reports on standardized scores of those children. The back scores. to the state. The score, a full score report. And so are you talking about that or are you talking about accounting of how the money is spent? Also teacher certification. We don't have any proof that the teachers are certified in these schools. We don't know what curriculum they're teaching. But if it's a parent's choice, is that for you to worry about? A parent absolutely should choose whatever school is best for them. I wholeheartedly believe in that. But as a taxpayer, if our money is being spent somewhere and we are holding traditional public schools accountable when taxpayer dollars are going there, we know how many teachers are certified, we know the curriculum, we hold them to certain standards, then we should do the same for the charters and private schools where the 2.7 billion tax dollars are going. Let, let me ask you, Mary, about the $8,000 that, that a family would take with them if they want to exit public schools. Uh, there are schools that will take that as tuition, right. period, the end. There are schools that charge $30,000 annual tuition, and that does not level that playing field right. for a student with the $8,000 voucher. Um, how do you how do you reconcile that? Well, I mean, I think it would be completely unfair to say we're going to give you the $30,000, right? Because we are talking about taxpayer dollars, so we need to be fiduciary in that sense. But what we are saying is that it's not about, you know, a lot of times there's people saying, oh, there's public funds going into private schools. No, there isn't. What we are doing is giving parents freedom. We're giving parents choice. And they are taxpayers as well. So they are getting their taxpayer dollars and making that choice of where they want their children to go to school. That, that's totally an interesting perspective. Just talk to me a little bit about, yes, there are taxpayers, but tax goes into a big pot to pay for people to get educated, be safe, mm -hmm. some, some things like that. And in, in this case, might it cannibalize the public school system that is in place to make sure education is equitable? Look, I was working in the public school system when we had the rise of charters. And all of a sudden, for the first time, we started talking about customer service. It was like this revelation, right, that we needed to be more appropriate with our parents, we needed to engage our parents, and so it has brought competition. And if you look at the Miami-Dade County, that was the rise of our magnet schools. We are one of the top schools in the country for our magnet programs. So what did the rise of charter schools do? It made us a better district. And so anything that will make us better at the end is, is a good thing. As a, as a businesswoman, do you buy into that? So I actually went to DASH before I graduated from Palmetto, so I am a product of our incredible magnet schools. Um, and I'm very proud of, of our magnet program. And again, school choice is absolutely what we need to give to parents. Again, as a taxpayer in District 7, I want to make sure that my tax dollars are going to places where there is accountability and transparency. And unfortunately, with the voucher program, that's not true. I want to get into what we call the elephant in the room. There is politics in this race, no doubt, except this is a nonpartisan race. And it may be the last one because Amendment 1 on the ballot, which we'll talk about in a little bit in depth. Um, but right now it's a nonpartisan race, but clearly Democrats and Republicans are heavily invested in Republicans, in Mary Blanco, Democrats and Max Tuckman. And, um, and for all the reasons that we've just been talking about for the past several minutes about the direction of the school board, uh, let me ask you this, let me open this segment, Max, with you. Um, politics on the school board is something you said you wanted to remove, in le but you will br be bringing your own politics to the school board. Well, and I think, you know, no matter what, everyone is individually registered as either some party or non-party affiliated. Um, but when school boards are nonpartisan, when the elections are nonpartisan, it forces us to talk to everybody. I s personally knocked on over 10,000 doors. <laughs> and I talked to Democrats, Republicans, NPAs, independents, everyone. And what I found is that we really can find common ground. When we go to the, to the people's doors, I mean, if you look at the headlines, you think we're on the brink of a civil war. But when you talk to people at their doors, people just 
want the basics. They want academics back as the focus. They want the extremism out of the classrooms. And they want decisions about their children and grandchildren to be made based off of research, based off of studies, based off of what is in the best interest of children, not in what politicians want in our classrooms. I, I'm not sure anyone remembers this far back five minutes ago, but you both have used the word extremism in the classroom, which is so fascinating to me. Um, Mary, the, the politics of the basics really don't exist. The politics of the other stuff besides the basics is what exists. And, and you're living that push and pull right now on the school board. What, what do you were, the governor's appointee. Um, obviously he appointed you rather than someone else for a reason. How encumbered are you by what the state wants for Miami-Dade? Look, as you mentioned, I was appointed by him, but I am my own person. And I think anybody who follows the board will see when you look at the items that I've brought forth, like you mentioned, it is about the students and it is about our teachers and it is about the safety and security and the mental health of our students. And that is my focus on the school board. Um, you know, as, as my opponent mentioned, he's absolutely right. I, count, I knocked on many doors as well, met everybody. And it was amazing. There were some people who didn't want to hear anything from me and they closed the door on my face and that was fine. Why? Take, take me they, through that They process. immediately called called me, um, you know, that if I'm a book banner and things like that, and they didn't want to talk to me. Have you, did you experience anything like that at anyone's door? I was actually surprised that I had not one hostile door. Um, was able to really, I'm actually really proud of where my yard signs are. They're under all different political banners and political flags. So but, then um, did, does, but, that, but, does that concern you that because I'm, you have a party that whether it's perception or reality. Right. No, but, like but if you give me a chance, because there was oh, more absolutely. that I wanted to say. Of course. Um, that was actually very rare. That happened oh, okay. once or twice, right? But there were a couple people that um, said, you know, uh, I don't agree with some of your things, but can we have a conversation? And I said, absolutely. And I would spend up to 20, 30 minutes at somebody's door. And by the end of the conversation, they said, you know, I really didn't think that I would vote for you. But after speaking with you, hearing the things that you have to say, hearing your priorities on the board, you have absolutely have my vote. And so I do understand that part, that part, right, that it should be nonpartisan. But the reality is that so many things are happening in our country. And as we talked about earlier, it has entered our schools. And people want to know where you stand. And so many times, the first question I was asked, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And so while it is ideal that we would have nonpartisanship, I think the voters want to know where people stand. So if this, um, if, if this goes to a, uh, oh, well, let me just ask you this, will you be voting for Amendment 1? If you're at liberty <laughs> to say here, and you don't have to, I recognize privacy rights right here at the table, but mm -hmm. do you wanna share what you'll be voting? I think we should keep school board races nonpartisan because again, it forces our, our candidates and our members to act in a nonpartisan way when it comes to children and not in a way to make decisions that appease their political party. You should appease the public. Mary, will you yeah. be will you be open to sharing your views? Sure, on him, him and on? and I don't think you know. And you asked this earlier, right? Do I see myself as a as a appointee of the governor? I'm not there to appease a party. I'm not there to appease. I'm there to do what's best for the children. Uh, it just so happens that my values ha are aligned with the conservatives, right? Um, and I, I believe, like I said, m almost every door I knocked on, their first question was, are you Republican or Democrat? And I would say, this is a nonpartisan race. And they would say, no, no, but tell us, what are you? And so if it provides transparency, then yes, I'm a, in agreement with Amendment 1. So if Amendment 1 passes, people will know, you'll have a D and an R on the ballot, people will know, but then in the primaries to choose those candidates, NPAs, a a mm -hmm. third, I don't, I'm not sure about the county breakdown in the state, it's a third of people, yeah. it's about Very a third, have no say. Is that concerning to you? Very. Very. Absolutely. Again, these are all of our children. These are our children and grandchildren. These are our community members. This is our future workforce. This is our future communities, These are our future leaders. And these are also the taxpayer dollars that we are giving to this system. And so NPAs absolutely should have a voice in this race. Mary, what do you think about that? Um, you know, it, it is unfortunate, right, that they wouldn't be able to to give that vote. Um, but it's something that happens for what they choose that party. That's something that happened or, or non-party, I should say. It's something that happens as well with a presidential race or any other race that they're not voting in the primary. It does. You know, before we we have a couple of minutes left, and and I really want to bring this back around to a constituency in the school district that really doesn't get a lot of attention in these races, and that is the teachers. And, you know, teacher pay in Florida, there has been absolutely some raises allocated, but still in Florida, average teacher pay is dead last in the country. Yep. Um, we hear from teachers a lot. 
people who really have invested their time and their, it's their calling into the students who are burned out, who can't afford rent. Uh, what is Miami-Dade, the, the bond issue that funded a bit more for teachers is about to come to a close. Mary Blanco, w address the teachers in Miami-Dade and uh, let them know what you would do for them sitting right. in that seat. Our teachers are absolutely our priority. Without our teachers, we don't have learning going on in the classroom. And so it's not only a priority for me, but it's a priority for our board. And we want to make sure that they are compensated appropriately. One of the things that we can do is a lot is advocate at Tallahassee because a lot of the issues with our funding comes with the cost differential. And so that's something that I definitely intend to do. And one of the conversations that we have all the time on the board, and it is something that I constantly bring up. Unfortunately, we had to cancel actually a workshop um, this last week because of the storm. We had to cancel our committee meeting is having conversations where we work together with the county and with private developers to start having affordable housing for our employees and that is something that we need to be able to start providing to our teachers on, on land that school board owns yes mm -hmm. Max Tuckman address that you were a teacher yeah you, you are a teacher yeah and um, as a first-year teacher I made thirty three thousand dollars a year I, I mean that's just completely <laughs> unacceptable all right as a beginning journalist I made yeah. 11 so, <laughs> so I win yeah but, no fair um, enough so so <laughs> talk talk to teachers here yeah. What could you do? And, and interesting that Mary mentioned going to Tallahassee and advocate. Yeah. In Tallahassee right now, Republican advocates right. are, are better than Democrat advocates, not better, but more successful than Democratic activists. But also, and that's the, just the, the way the of the world at the moment. And our, our school board also has That a may not always yeah. be that way, but you know, but talk to teachers about yeah. what you could do in that seat for them. No, absolutely, and as someone who has experienced what they've experienced, right? As someone who was in the classroom just like you, who knows how hard it is to, to be a teacher, especially in these environments um, and this economic environment as well. Uh, we, it's, it's unacceptable that we have been an A-rated school district for so long, and yet we've had to go to our, our citizens, to our voters, to get a higher teacher pay, uh, to, to increase our teacher salaries. That's unacceptable that we haven't given our teachers the raises that they deserve. And what can you do sitting in a school board seat yeah. to no, change that? And I think that's the difference. You know, For years, we've had a Republican kind of controlled school board and a, a Republican majority legislature, and yet nothing has been done to bring those dollars back. We're a donor county. We send more tax dollars to Tallahassee than we are given back for our, you know, per pupil. Uh, I need to, we have um, one second left. Uh, that is a whole subject we can get into too. I just wanted to say thank you. I'm very grateful that you're both here. Thank Mary Blanco, Max us. Tuckman, best of luck in this, to you both in this, uh, in this campaign that is very difficult to get through. And we'll see you on the other side. Great, thank you. Thank you.